Greetings, fellow Homo sapiens. Today, I'm here with Garun Ganambili, and he is a drummer and music educator and a very good friend of mine. Pretty much the main reason why I'm still here in Bombay. Uh, Garun, welcome to the program. Hey, it's great to be here. It's great to talk to you, and I haven't actually spoken to you in, in quite a long time. It's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit ridiculous. It's been a while. Ridiculous. As you would say, it's been a minute. It's been a hot minute. Uh, you know, we normally uh-huh. do a little thing at the beginning of this, 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 this podcast, you know, about names and pronunciations and mispronunciations. We try to do it whenever we, we, can, we can manage a, a mispronunciation. Uh, I would imagine that even within the subcontinent, your last name gives people a little bit of, a little bit of trepidation fr- from time to time. What is the best way to pronounce your last name? Um, so I say Kanampali, but I, I wouldn't fault anyone for saying it uh, weirdly or wrong because like, it's a hard name, man. It's, it's long. You know, it's, it's, it's more long than it is hard, right? I think. This, this is true. This you is know? true. Actually, uh, that, more people get my first name wrong than my last name, you know, because like um, I say, hi, my name is Karun. And they're, they're like, oh, you must have mispronounced it. You must be Karan. Um, so that that happens more than someone. Like, getting, <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. Butchering you must be name. Karan. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Yeah, yeah you, that's great. I love that. I love it when people. You don't know your name. Yeah. I love it when people just decide on your behalf uh, what uh, what your name should be. <laughs> that's good. Um, so there's lots we can talk about. And, you know, even before before you know we talk about anything it's important for people out there who are listening to know and uh, n- know realize to absorb the fact that basically the reason why i'm still here after five years of move you know after i first moved here i moved to bombay in 2015 right at the beginning and a huge part of the reason almost the 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 entire reason that i'm still here is because because you and Basically, uh, you know, my girlfriend at the time, who happens to be from Bombay, but we were, in, you know, we were in Toronto, we were dating. She, because of a mutual, because of her auntie, basically, a family friend who she refers to as auntie. It's a series of events to cut a very long and meandering story short. That that auntie gave me your phone number because I was new in town. Say, hey, you should call this guy, Karun. You know, he's a drummer, he's a musician, and maybe that, that'll be cool. And I did I did that. Send you a message, and as a result of that, you you had have be, had basically taken me in, taken responsibility for me as a human being <laughs> in this new city, and pretty much made sure that I was like integrated into the social the social scene, the social part of the of the the music community here before anything else really uh i mean it was i didn't really do any sort of major projects here until until the cognac net record we did like a a small collaboration in that first year uh but shake the dust right that poem yeah yeah but other than that like it's one of my proudest moments that one Really? That's that's really like interesting. I'm, I'm really proud of that project. Like, I, I it was a small one-off thing, but I I mm-hmm. go back to it every once in a while. I was like, cool, this is cool. Like, I I'm happy. I create we created this. Like that, it it gives yeah. me lots of joy. I'm really gra- I'm really glad we did that one too. Um, and I mean, I in that first year, I didn't have any agenda, like any serious agenda of collaborating with anybody. I mean, I just sort of moved over here, uh, because of some pretty extraneous and crazy circumstances so i was kind of just like regrouping and re you know re trying to figure out myself reevaluating my whole kind of purpose in life and in that first year you you like made sure that i like went out to events went out to shows if there was a party or a gathering you kind of like made sure that i you, you know you give me a call you'd, you'd invite me and then after some time i remember you explicitly telling some of our mutual friends namely Jason and, and Krell, you were like, listen, you guys got to start inviting him to things because I can't invite him to everything. And <laughs> like, uh, that's, that is actually, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a really uh, n- nice thing to do. It sounds like a, a funny thing to say, but it's very proactive that you kind of like made sure that I was like integrated into the whole social fabric so that by the end of that year, I mean, I didn't know what I was going to be doing, uh, you know, after the end of that year. I said, oh, let, let me give it a year in Bombay. Let's see what happens. But pretty much because of you and also, you know, friends like like Jason and Krell and, and a, a small group of other people, it's why I'm still here. It's because uh, y'all made me feel so accepted here. And this is before 
this is before any type of real, like, you know, large scale project or, you know, opportunity of that nature. And so, you know, that was a bit of a bit of a rant, but it kind of needs to be said and it needs to be put out there into the into the world that like, you know, thanks to people like you, some random guy like me was able to show up here and, you know, have some have some modest success. Uh, and, you know, I got to accomplish a lot of things that I, you know, never thought I would, you know, uh, one of those things being getting to produce the uh, the last Cognac Net album. Man, that was a blast working on that together. That was really so really much fun. fun. Yeah, it was it was so much fun. And so like this kind of brings me around to kind of I, I want to list some of the things that you're involved in. So you, the, the Cognac Net is, is like one of your main projects. You're the drummer in that band. Since then, you formed a few other projects, I believe. You, there's this new band I just saw on Insta. It was uh, something related to dinosaurs. You want to just quickly plug that? Yeah, so it's a so basically it's Dino Siren. Um, mm-hmm. It's a new band that Ishan and I have started together. Um, and it's like, um, be, we're trying to follow the journey. It sounds silly because it is silly. Uh, we're trying to fo- follow the journey of that's a dinosaur. Okay, that's great. <laughs> a dinosaur, like knowing the world is going to come to the end. And um, he's just basically trying to get his message across through fun indie music. Yeah. Um, so that's like the, concept behind the band and um, we're putting out our first single which releases on the 7th of august i don't know when this airs but oh very cool very cool yeah 7th of august so maybe it's already out so that's one of your that's one of your newest projects there's like um a, a lot we can yeah. dig in into the i mean you're, you're you're a drummer in the scene so you you you, you play drums uh, you play drums on uh, various out al- like recordings and you you play with other uh, other acts as well, uh, aside from the Cognac Net and 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 uh, was well, repeat the name of the dinosaur thing again. I need to g- get this in my head properly. Di- <laughs> Dino Siren. Also, we like so neither of us can sing really well. So every time we do something, we're going to try and have um, singers that we like on it. So this time we had Azu and um, Malika on, on it. I mean, I love their voices. So like, I'm really happy mm-hmm. that they sang for it. And, um, and they're, 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 so Dino Siren is what it's called. Sorry. The, the two of them are peeps as well. I mean, we, we love the both of them. Uh, you know, so that's, that's very cool. Dino Siren. Okay. That's got to be imprinted in my mind. So I don't, don't, don't forget it later. So the other thing that besides, besides that, which I think is like pretty special about you is that you are, uh, you excel at, at, uh, music education. Like you're a really good teacher. Um, and I wanted to maybe start with that for like, you know, how, how did you, I mean, when did you start playing drums and how did you sort of, how did that kind of slowly morph into the, into the teaching role that you, that you kind of excel at? First of all, I have to say thank you, man. I've, I've come on here and I've just heard nice things about me. This is a great way to start your day. Well, you know, I'm not um, going to, you know, it's not that I didn't have you on the podcast to like trash you. I, I Not that I could really think of anything <laughs> shitty to say about you, but like... <laughs> Yeah, but uh, feels good, man. Feels good, uh, regardless. Um, so yeah, um, I, me, I love teaching. I think um, some of my biggest inspirations in life have been music teachers. So mm-hmm. um, I've I've gone through them all, like like everybody else, right? You've gone through the shitty music teacher who made you quit something, and mm-hmm. you've gone through the amazing teacher who really inspired you to do something, even if it's not for music. You you've dealt with these two types of teachers before. Yeah. And I was so inspired by like the the second type that I was like, I need to try and be that the best I can. Um and I'm also pretty like bad at learning stuff. I'm I'm dyslexic, so like in general, learning has always been a problem for me. And drums also didn't really come easy to me at all. Like they they were a struggle. I mean they still are a struggle. So because of that, because I'm not so great at picking up something and just being good at it, uh, I learned patience with myself, how, how to be patient with myself. So I try to try to do that with as many people as I can. You know, it's like, just be patient with yourself. I'm going to have all the patience in the world. We'll get through this and you'll be better tomorrow. Like, yeah, so well, that's that's pretty my philosophy, pretty much my philosophy towards that. Well, it definitely reflects, uh, and I mean, you've taken a lot of initiative. I know that you started the uh, this drum camp thing. How many years has it been now that you've been doing this drum camp situation? So I started a, a 
project called Drum House, which is basically a drum education kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so we started back in 2017, I think, when I was when I kind of felt like I'm not getting better at this point in my life. Like I was doing a lot, I was teaching a lot, I was playing in a lot of bands, but I felt like my personal progress was kind of stunted. So I wrote like a curriculum for myself and said I'm gonna go to Goa for seven days um, with like cut off from the world and just practice this curriculum. Um, and then I thought, uh, how am I going to be alone for seven days? That <laughs> I, I'm not that kind of, a, it's not, not me. Like, you know, I, I'm a really social person, as you know, like I, I like going out. Yeah. I like, I like meeting people. I like introducing people to people. Like I like joining all of my circles, basically. Um, that is a so, very accurate description of, of, uh, <laughs> of you socially. Yeah. So I, I like, I, I want to have one big circle, not like seven smaller circles, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I just messaged a few drum friends and I was like, yo, uh, do you, do you guys want to do this with me? Um, uh, and they all said yes immediately. So we packed a bunch of drums into a bunch of cars and drove to Goa, um, set up in my house, apologized to the neighbors beforehand and, um, <laughs> just went for it for seven days. And I think that's how it started. And, so we did it like twice, thrice, and then we were like, I, I, Dheer and I, who also helped me start this thing, uh, we thought, okay, cool, I think we can bring this to the public now. And that's how the first actual drum camp started. And now this is our fourth one, I think, that we're doing. So how many, uh, when you say fourth, do you mean fourth, not including like the first few where it was just in a tight circle of, of, yeah. of our... For, yeah. And um, so like, wh- what correct. is the size? Like, h- like, how many spots do you uh, do you take um, in a typical drum house? So the first couple were like just six people. Um, mm-hmm. So they were really small, intimate groups. Um, and then the next one we did, we got Darshan Doshi on board, who really like had a much bigger vision for it. Like he wanted to he wanted to have like a huge camp. So we managed to make that happen and that was like 30 people from all over India and um, oh, wow. that was the last one we did um, and the next one that's coming up still at your place in Goa? no 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 <laughs> we had to move out we got like we got venue partners and like uh, gear partners and like it's evolved since since the DIY put your drums in a car and go to Goa that's amazing and I actually didn't uh, didn't even know that it kind of had ev- evolved in that way and it's it's sort of amazing what you can do when you st- like you start something kind of innocently enough and then it evolves into something where yeah like before you know it you have venue partners and and partners for for equipment and stuff like it, it's amazing and I'm you know I I'm glad that people get to hear about that because it just goes to show what can happen when you just decide to start start something you know on your own you know, take, take your initiative. You in, in what way was the drum house sort of influenced by the drum camp that you guys, uh, you and a bunch of other drummers in our scene, uh, went to, it was in Ireland, no? Yeah. So, I, so the first drum camp I went to, uh, was in 2011. It was a Mike Johnston drum camp. I'm actually staring at a poster of him right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, uh, it was a Mike Johnston drum camp in 2011. Uh, and that really, really changed my, like approach to drums and how one can learn. Like, you know, it, it really gave me a much broader view of the instrument. And I was like, why the, why the fuck isn't there anything like that here? So I was mm-hmm. thinking whether, can I say fuck? Can I not say fuck? I realize it's a podcast. Of course you can. Um, yeah. All right. So, um, and, yeah, say, uh, say fuck then, as much as you want. Nice. Yeah. Um, so then, uh, I came back and I had this, like, I wanted to start something like this, um, when I came back, but, uh, you know, like with everything, stuff fades. So it faded like that, that desire to like start something like this faded. Mm-hmm. And then eventually uh, they were doing this massive camp in Ireland. This is Mike Johnston, Mark Juliana and Ash Sohn. And I love all three of those drummers. So as soon as I heard about it, I was like, uh, I am going. And I, again, same situation where I messaged a few friends and I was like, Hey, I'm going for this. <laughs> Do you want to be a part of it? And they all we need like, to go as a team. Yeah, we need to go as a team. Represent India. There were five of us. Well, I want to interrupt you for a second because I'm getting a little bit sorry. I'm getting a little bit confused in the in the in the storyline. Th- so the, the 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 current drum the the drum camp with Mark Juliana and all this stuff. The, the, this is the second one you went to. Did you just say that you went to one before that? Yeah. What, yes, where was yes. that? So one? this was in 2016. The that was in. Um, California, I'm going to say. 
Uh, yeah, right. California. Okay. I, I, I didn't even know about California, that. Yeah. I think. Because I remember the I remember the one you were just about to talk about. So this this is okay. Yeah. So you you got a delegation together of of you know m- mostly people that I know that that are that are you know mutual friends, uh, all really amazing drummers. And so this one was in Ireland, and you basically ended up ended up like sending a whole delegation from Bombay. Yeah. Basically <laughs> representing like the whole. <laughs> It was quite hilarious. We went with kurtas and like Nehru jackets for them. Like we, we, yeah, we course, properly so went like to. good, good Indian boys. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Man, um, so it was a great that, time. that's really interesting. And I mean, I don't know if you you want to you want to talk about this, but there was there was like some like visa trepidations. No, like there was like people were worried Ooh. about visas and stuff last minute. And the reason I ask that is because, you know, like depending on where people are listening, that people may, may not appreciate how much of an issue that can be for musicians in, in India when, when uh, people want to go abroad, whether it's for a camp or whether it's to play a show. Uh, sometimes, you know, you get you get like a gig or you get accepted to something, but then like there's all kinds of fuckery involved with the visa process just because of, you know just for Lord knows why, you know, geopolitics or, 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 or God, God knows. So, I mean, uh, is there anything that you can kind of uh, sh- sh- shed light on your experience with that whole visa situation? Man, the visa situation was a nightmare. Like, basically, I applied for a visa. Three of us got rejected for our visas. Mm-hmm. Um, so we applied so much in advance because we knew what we had to do, you know, you know, like the chances of you getting rejected are there. Um, Three of us applied, got rejected uh, and then reapplied, got rejected the second time. And then like after tons of emails to the embassy, um, to like anyone we knew who could help, uh, even like the, the camp organizers were like, you know, it's, it's a bunch of revenue that you're canning us for. Like, you know, like you're, you're canceling three, people coming to this camp for no reason like so there was pressure that we both and it was th- i mean there was more than three of you that that were going right like yeah, how there many were five of, the, of us were, there were f- in total that was five of us going um hmm? one already had a visa from before okay. so he was chill aditya ashok um yeah. he had a, a uk visa which counted for a, a visa that you could use in ireland um and uh, jeremy applied through later than all of us and he got through somehow um yeah yeah which uh, which is surprising because I mean, he's so, the uh, most shady looking character out of all he, of Je- us. Jebs is the most shady looking out of, out of the, out of the bunch. That's a fact. Uh, shout yeah. out Jebs. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, the, <laughs> the, 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 there's two, two things I kind of wanted to uh, the, uh, sort of, uh, latch onto there. So the first thing was like, it's commendable. It, it says a lot, but it's also commendable and amazing the extent you went through to sort of get this, Get get this message across, because like if it was me, I would have just stopped after the first first rejection. You got rejected twice, and then you have to like call the embassy and and formulate an argument that'd be like, hey, you're like losing all this this yeah. this revenue from for your economy, and like what are you doing? So that's really amazing. Um, but then the other thing that I kind of wanted you to maybe share with people is like, what were the what were the silly reasons that they were providing uh, for rejecting the visa? Man, they have a template. They just send you like a a, a pre-written letter that if they reje- rejected you for anything, they have this one letter ready. So mm-hmm. it, they don't really give you specific reasons. So you have to like cover a, any possible reason. So like my second application was about the the length of a novel with bank records, <laughs> with um, like letters of employment, letters of leave. Um, I mean, all of this was there in the first application too, but now the details, income tax um, uh, returns, like, you know, every single possible documentation with clearly labeled post-its um, and just like fully organized into files. Man, it took me maybe a week or more to just make that application ready and it just got rejected with that same exact letter coming back. That's crazy. That's that's like a lesson in in... in bureaucracy as well um but yeah so you went through you went to like extraneous lengths to to correct the situation so that you could get the visas to finally get to the camp right man it was a super happy day when we got it like i remember jumping around like it was amazing 
And, and I mean, uh, the camp, I remember when you guys were there and, and y- y- y'all were talking about it when you, when you came back, it, it must have been, uh, an, a, an amazing and unique experience, especially with, with drummers of such caliber, like as the instructors. Man, it was just, it's not just the instructors, you know, even though that was like invaluable getting their opinions, hearing, like hearing them talk, sitting down and eating with them. Like all of that was so cool. Mm -hmm. Um, But it was also, there were, so it's called 21 drums, right? This camp, there are 21 drummers all together who are learning. Um, So you get to learn so much from these guys and like just hanging with 20 p- other people who all want to do what you want to do mm-hmm. in some, like, at least s- to some extent, yeah. um, is amazing. And it was so inspiring. And like, every time I even think about that, it pushes a little bit of inspiration back up. Like, it's so good. Yeah, it's good to know. And so were, uh, were you guys the only one that sort of arrived in this sort of delegation format, you know, with like a... <laughs> Yep, we went like That's one great. big Indian family. <laughs> yeah, that, the, I, that the the idea of that makes me uh, pleases me, makes me quite happy. Um, so, <laughs> what would, would I be correct in saying that that was in it, sort of an inspiration for the the drum house thing that you've started, or like? Of course, of course. So yeah. when I came back from that, I was I, I was so inspired, and then I felt that inspiration fading over time, and I was like this can't happen. Like, Mm -hmm. I I can't let this inspiration fade and wait another four or five years to go for another camp. Um, And these camps are expensive, man. You have to save up a ton of money to be able to go for one of them. Um, So I was like, fuck this. I need to make it happen here. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. And I mean, now now you're inspiring a a new generation of musicians. So that's, that's quite something. You got your start with teaching at, uh, at TSM. Is that correct? Um, I was teaching before TSM, but like, yeah, I guess my first official teaching position was with TSM. Yeah. But that, uh, so uh, TSM stands for a true school of music. And the, basically the first day that we met, you took me there uh, because there was a master class, um, a, dr- a, dr- a drumming master class. And so I was, I mean, I was just super impressed with that facility. Uh, and it is, it's such a cool thing that that, that place exists, but uh, you're, you're not with them anymore. Um, no, not with them anymore, but like my, the four years I spent at TSM, I think were amazing. And I learned so much from that place. Mm-hmm. So, uh, when did you start playing the drums? Like, uh, I, I'm not sure if I've ever even asked you that. Um, just out of college, I think. So, um, 2008, I guess. Okay. Um, just out of college, there's a store, there's a store right near Xavier's college where I went to college, which was called Fotados and it's a music store. Um, so I used to, we used to go in there and they had one electronic drum kit that was set up for display. Uh, so we used to just take turns on that and my friends used to show me, okay, check this out. Can you do this? And that's kind mm. of how the next seven or eight years went of me just trying to learn things from friends and YouTube. Yep. Yep. Um, and like the, the main style of music that you're inspired by, I would say is, uh, indie rock. Am I correct in saying that? Completely. Yeah. Like I, I, I love listening to all types of music, but um, every once in a while, I listen to some indie rock and be like, "Okay, this is me as a person. This is like what what really yeah. gets me." Mm-hmm. Um, and so, the first, what what were some of the first bands that you that you were pl- like that you got the chance to play in? Um, so, the first band I ever played in, I think it was called Altered Reality. Not the best mm-hmm. name, um, but we were young and stupid. I'm still stupid, yeah. but a little less young. Um, yeah. But um, so Altered Reality was with Varun Das and Sanchit. Um, and it was like the most f- fun band. We took ourselves like not seriously at all. It's important. Um, and that band kind of evolved into Modern Mafia. Yeah, that ba- band evolved into Modern Mafia. And I think playing with Modern Mafia was like one of the... M- best times of my life i had so much fun in that band mm-hmm. and uh when did you start playing for the cognac then um i can't remember the year but i basically how it happened was that aditya ashok played on the album on david's first album which mm-hmm. was um uh, one last monsoon and he was super busy at the time i think he was playing with shire and funk and sky harbor and a bunch of other people um and he couldn't do this project so and he knew it was like an indie rock project and i love indie rock so he was like hey karan do you want to like play for this project 
um and i said cool this sounds really cool so david called me the next day and said hey uh i was looking for a drummer would you be interested in playing i said uh yeah that sounds cool and the very next day i saw my name in a oml article yeah. an h7 article which said that karun kanam plays the drummer of konyak and i was like oh i guess I, i've never really met this guy before but i guess i'm the drummer now um and that's how it started oh yeah well there you go So it like in that time I mean how how has your like n- when we were working on the Cognac Net album the drum parts that you you have have come up with in the most recent album are very well thought out and precise and even the drum sound is is quite precise in, in terms of the types of sound you're trying to t- trying to create I mean when I was when I was mixing that album, you know, you the the snare sound that that you were going for is something that's super different than what I'm used to, and it kind of opened me up to a whole new way of mixing or treating a snare drum. But I I imagine, I mean, I don't know how one gets to that point, right? Like cuz I I was influenced I was influenced so much by 90s music which has more of that kind of poppy like uh, not poppy as in pop the music tongue. but yeah that, that there you go that's that's the thing it has more of that ring it has more of that snap but the the snare sound that that you gravitate towards is quite different is a lot more warmth uh you've described it as kind of like you know a pillow which i i was puzzled by the first time you you uh said that to me but i think i kind of get what you mean now i mean after having worked on that record so like how did you get to that sound what what's the evolution of 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 you uh of you getting there man it's hard to say like exactly what i was influenced by but every time i hear a fat like soft sounding like a pillow man like if, yeah. every time i hear that snare it just it hits you straight in the stomach and it 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 makes me feel really good so to play and to listen to so um i don't know like every time i tune a snare i go for that first Like that's the tuning I go for first. I just my fingers know exactly how to get to it. Yeah. Uh, no matter what snare I'm on, um, like and it just I feel good playing it and I feel good hearing it and it's the sound of the drums in my head, right? So I I try to whatever sounds I can hear in my head is what I try to bring out onto the kit. Um, and so this is one very clear sound. Like sometimes I'm a little not sure about okay, what should a hi hat sound like or what should this what song what is what hi hats are needed on this song but with the snare and the kick i know for sure the sound i'm going for as soon as i hear the song so okay that that, that makes me want to ask you a couple of different questions i'm going to try to remember the the questions so i don't forget but the the first thing i wanted to ask you is like when you first started out playing the drums i mean is that just the sound you gravitated to, to towards from from the beginning cuz to me, and the reason i'm asking that is cuz to me it's not the first thing i i would think i mean i'm trying to like it's hard you know when you try to put yourself back to your teenage years or whatever but i it is not the 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 first thing that would have come to my mind so i'm trying to ima- imagine like what when you first got your own snare drum and you're there like is is that pretty much like i'm sure it's evolved and i'm sure it's refined but is that pretty much where you would kind of started started at with, with that idea um, of a snare drum in so your mind n- not exactly it was um i i went through the phase of like a I grew up listening to 311 and a bunch of bands with the tongue sound, right? So yeah. I, the first thing I went to was that exactly that, like the lots of overtones. That well, that's um, yeah, that's kind of why I asked you that, right? Like, because I, yeah. I think I think it's it's natural. I, I'm I, I don't know. I, it's, it's speculation to say that, but it it seems like so many people gravitate towards that in the beginning, right? I think now that I'm thinking about it like cuz I've never really thought about it before but now that I think about it it might be it might have come from the fact that the drums I had when I was growing up for a very long time were really crappy drums you know they were really yeah. cheap drums the first drum kit I had was this little pink drum kit that I, I don't think had a manufacturing name on it anywhere also um my friend broke through the kick drum by putting his foot through it you know it was like flimsy as all hell wow. um but uh basically these drums like the overtones you get out of these drums don't sound very pleasant so even though that was the sound i was going for in the start it was never a good version of that sound so um the more i muffle things and the more like i deaden them they sounded better yeah so i think then my ear kind of got used to that sound and i found a way to do that with uh, a good balance of like overtones and um 
fatness, I guess. Yeah. So in, in the beginning, you're just trying to mitigate the, the crappiness of the, the initial kit that you had that you were starting on. And then it kind of yeah. developed into, into this warm tone that you have now. The other thing that I wanted to ask you, because you just said this just now, and that's, uh, it's got me thinking. So you were saying that like, you know, you hear the song and then based on the song, you kind of like have an idea of the kind of snare sound that you want. Now, when we were tracking the Cognac Net album, I don't think we really adjusted the snare for each song or I don't remember us doing that. Did you, were you in the back just tuning it up differently without me noticing or? No. So for, for Cognac Net, I, I was thinking more like broadly as this is going to be the drum sound. Uh, for the, I wasn't for thinking the album. Particularly for the album. I, I mean, yeah. like there were a few things where I think we switched out snare drums and said, okay, is this snare drum going to work better? But eventually we went back to that same sound because I think yeah. it works for the sound of the cognac net. Um, and mm-hmm. our songs, even though they vary in style, I, I don't feel like the drum sound needs to change that much. It still needs that low end kick and that fat snare. Yeah. And it, it contributes to like making that record sound kind of glued together and, and just as a, mm-hmm. you know, single conceptual type thing. So then on the flip side, let's say you're in a, in a session situation and, you know, you're trying to think of different, different snare drum so- sounds for depending on what song you're working on. What are some of the techniques that you're, you're bringing to adjust the sound, dampen the sound? What are the, the some of the different ways that you're, you're, you're trying to do that? So my gig bag, like or my session bag, I guess, always has certain things that um, I carry with me. I carry a bunch of different sized O-rings, which is Remo's version of basically a muffling ring. Mm-hmm. Um, I carry a big fat snare drum, which is again, like a big thing you can put on top of your snare drum to make it sound fat, big fat. Um, and I carry uh, a tune bot, uh, and... Uh, which is like a drum tuner, like it gives you values of, okay, the, mm. the pitch is here. Um, so I start off where, where I think in the ballpark of what I'm comfortable with. And then mm-hmm. if I feel like, okay, cool, this is maybe going to get lost in the mix. Like if it's too low or too, um, too, I don't know, muddy, um, then I'll, with the tune bot, I'll be able to know how much higher I should go. Um, yeah. so I use the tune box in conjunction with my ear to try and figure out, okay, cool. Um, let's take this, say five, five up and hear what it sounds. Yeah. Now, let's, let's um, do a very quick, because you know, a lot of people are, uh, pretty confused and, and often scratching their head about how to tune a snare drum and it has become a meme. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in this group on Facebook called audio engineering shit posting and it is, I mean, like the, the notion of your snare sounding like shit has just become this, probably the most prevalent meme within music production, which is just, yeah, your snare is shit. No matter what you do, <laughs> your snare is shit. And, and also I've, I've even seen on my, in my social network, you know, people who are starting out recording and a lot of people are confused as to how to tune a snare drum. Just general, just generically speaking, you know, uh, you got a beginner that wants to know how to tune up their kit, but in particular wants to tune up their snare. What's the like uh, basics that you would communicate about how to do that? So I think one of the biggest tips for me, uh, I think, I don't remember where I got this from, but um, is tuning your resonant head, your ba- uh, bottom head, super tight. Like yeah. you don't really care about the pitch. You just crank that up to as far as, almost as far as it can go. Basically, um, you shouldn't be able to push your thumb into the ba- resonant head and easily. You should get like a lot of resistance over there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of because the, the shell is so shallow that like you're not going to get a lot of um, tone out of the resonant head because there's not that much time for the air to get to it. Uh, obviously, for much thicker drums, uh, it's a different, like uh, much wider drums, it's a different scenario, but most snare drums are uh, a certain dimension and need like, that tightness on the bottom head. Um, I think that solves a lot of your problems straight off the bat. Usually when your snare sounds like shit. See, I didn't know that. So I think that, that, that'll be helpful to people. Yeah. Usually if your snare sounds like shit, just tune up that bottom head to like really tight and it'll sound better already. Um, yeah. For the top head, it's, it's, it's just like what I do at least is like, I like to get it where it feels nice to play for me. For me. So, mm-hmm. I mean, that just comes with trial and error to see uh where it feels nice for you 
and then after that you go from there because that's like I, I have a comfort spot and then it's easy to see like where I can go from that spot whether I need to go higher or lower but right. my muscle memory after, after tuning for so long has just been able to get me to that comfort spot really easy on various drums and the it, just generally in terms of the each sort of uh, lug in and around the the the, the drum, I guess. The, what are they called? Lug, bolt. What, what would you call them? Yeah, lugs yeah. Is You want to make sure you're getting. Uh, is it is it true you're going to want to make sure you're getting s- similar pitch uh, on each sort of, or is that does that yeah? Not so matter? like the tune bot. Re- no, so it does matter. I mean, like, I mean, there are other techniques to get a dead snare head. Uh, it's but that is the standard, right? You want to get mm-hmm. um, a, a similar pitch uh, on around everything. Uh, so you tune roughly with the same tension, right? Like it's it's just doing it a lot, honestly. Like I can yeah. give you all the tips you want, but it's literally just doing it a lot because yeah. your your muscles kind of have to know where that tension is to kind of be able to roughly tune and get to the get to a certain level where the pitches are already kind of even and mm-hmm. then you go hit around the drum and hear okay fine no this is slightly higher or this is slightly lower and you adjust it um but also the tune board really helps with that like if you do that um in conjunction with the tune board use your ear and the tune board you have like a visual representation of the pitch as well so yeah i think that really really helps at least for me cuz um I'm not so great with like hearing how to match pitches. Like, uh, so this yep. really, really helps me. It's a, it's a mystery with drums. I mean, like, it, mm-hmm. you know, there's some people that are, that are quite good at hearing these pitches and just the different, different spots on a single drum and they can hear all this information that it is totally over my head. Uh, so I imagine something like a tune bot would help, uh, quite a bit. What are some, uh, what are some of your preferred dampening or muffling techniques uh just all around not just the snare drum but definitely starting with a snare drum what what types of muffling techniques are are useful so what i used to dampen and muffle um my snare drum is usually like a, a an o-ring just like a small little o-ring um that works really well but with the other drums first of all i like really open toms so i don't like muffling my toms so much um mm-hmm. like but obviously there are moments where you need to muffle your toms so uh, what i use for that is usually just a piece of tape man i'm not a fancy guy i use tape sometimes i'll put a tissue under the tape um mm-hmm. sometimes i will use moon gel if i have it um uh, but uh, that's pretty much it i i don't think too much about what i'm using to muffle the toms i just put tape until it sounds good yeah I, that reminds me of that Aaron Sterling masterclass that we were watching at your place, right? It's just Pretty like, much. you know, tape to taste, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So the, uh, some of the shifting gears a little bit, some of the other acts you play, what are some of the other acts you're, you're playing for here in the, in the scene? So right now, um, I, I played on Raghav Miatal's uh, last album mm-hmm. that he's been promoting a lot recently. He just put out a new music video for Bar Talk. That's really nice. You should definitely check that out. Um, and uh, I'm playing with Kamakshi Khanna, um, recording some new songs for her upcoming album. Um, mm-hmm. So that's going to be really fun. And I've done a couple of one-off sessions with a few different artists um, of late. Uh, but yeah, I'm... To be honest, I can't remember names super well, but I've done a few different sessions with a couple of art, uh, upcoming artists. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. It means you got you got lots of work. So what's uh, what's the uh, Raghav Mietel stuff like? Like what? Uh, how would you describe the music? And what what's what, what what's the difference between playing in that in that type of a scenario versus playing in a band like the Cognac Net, where if I'm not mistaken, especially on on the last record, there's a lot more creative. Uh, input, I guess, the, uh, in the in the Cognac Net stuff, and maybe a sense of ownership, or maybe I'm wrong about that. What's the? No, that it's true. I mean, with with uh, Raga's last album, he had uh, Zane had Zane Kalkitawala had played all the drums, uh, like had created all the drum parts. Uh, mm-hmm. So I just I pretty much played his drum parts with tweaking some spots where I felt like okay, this is a little bit more me, um, mm-hmm. and um, just a few spots like that where I changed stuff, but. Overall, I think they were his drum parts. Um, and uh, 
with Cognac Night, obviously, I'm building everything from scratch. The new Raghav stuff, though, um, like he put out a song called City Life um, and some other stuff that uh, I feel like I can create some of the parts uh, with enough freedom. I mean, the focus of the the project is Raghav Miatal, right? Like, so yeah. I, my job is just to make sure that I don't do anything that takes away from uh, Raghav Miatal, right? It yeah. has to be the singer-songwriter space. So that's the kind of approach I take. I just want to be in the background and nobody should notice me. And if, I, if, that's, if I've done that, then I've done my job. Yeah. Um, and what, like, what, from the show point of view, like in terms of performing live, what, what's what's the difference between say a, a cognac net gig uh organizing a show it, it, whereas i think um I, I guess it, with Raghav, he's more in the driver's seat or like what's the what's the difference it's a lot less stress mm-hmm. like um because Raghav takes most of that stress him and his management team will take most of the stress of um putting on the show getting things organized yeah with cognac net it often comes down to me and say Adil trying to trying to figure out all of the logistics and um, making making sure we promoted the gig enough and yeah like I mean all band all the band members contribute uh, but uh, uh, most of the logistics we have to figure out so it's it's much more stressful than going for a rag of gig um, but uh, it's also more fun because like you know you you feel you feel like oh look what what we made happen um mm-hmm. versus like just being a guest at the show and having yeah. to play and walk away they they both yeah, have yeah. Their, they both have their like pros and cons i guess well no I mean, in the cognac net i if i'm not mistaken like even among some of the other members you you like have a bit of more of an uh initiative role that's a weird way of saying it a more like you're you're involved in the logistics <laughs> A bit more, even like say Jason, he he likes to just show up and, and kind of play, and he's happy with that. Like you know, right? So it's like, but I, I like yeah. after David, if I'm not like I just remember this from when I was working with you guys. Like y- you also have a pretty uh, hands-on role in stuff behind the scenes, aside from just being the drummer. Yeah. Um. So I try to like because a lot of times with any project, right? If if um, there's not somebody saying hey let's do this <laughs> hey we should do this constantly <laughs> yeah. then the project dies and yep. um i think at different phases of the cognac net we've had different people doing that sometimes yep. uh david's in the driver's seat sometimes i i try to push as much as i can and i, I and adil does that as well i think we're the three mm-hmm. main people who do that um but Everyone does their role. Um, like yeah. J- Jason will come and just play the gig and be happy. Won't won't have to worry about anything else. But he will also like mix and master everything that we put. Like yep. a- anything other than the albums that we've done, right? And even the first two albums, like yep. he's done everything. So um, he's always doing that part of it. Aaron, for the actually, last- that's probably worth worth mentioning because I, you know, like the reason why Jason was so chill with the last album and kind of hands off was because he actually did put a lot of effort into mixing and mastering the previous uh, the previous record, if I'm not mistaken. So he was yeah. happy to just you kind of be like, okay, like somebody else is producing and mixing and mastering this one, and so yeah. uh, you know maybe. Uh, I, I have that perception because I came in for it to, <laughs> to fill that role in this last project. But yeah, yeah, that's exactly. that's that's wor- worth mentioning uh, for sure. And uh, like, um, Aaron also does a bunch of stuff. Like he puts he puts um, puts on the basically he has access to a lot of visual knowledge and light equipment so mm-hmm. if if we're ever doing a diy show like he sorts out all of the visuals and lights along with the wolves is it the wolves is it just yeah. wolves i think it's just wolves but you i don't know saying. i need to have i need to have those guys on the on the podcast as well because i really like what they do and the visuals that they had for um for your album release was was super awesome like and that was just an uh, excellent show Aaron worked really, really hard yeah. on those. Like yeah. he, he put his heart into that stuff. And uh, when we were when we were tracking the album, a lot of the amplifiers that we had access to was also thanks to to Aaron and his his dad, if I'm not mistaken. So we got to use really, yeah. really awesome gear. Um, so yeah, it's definitely definitely a team effort. Um, so what you know the pl- how has the scene 
evolved in these last five years. It seems like in the time I've been here, things have just been blowing up despite some of the things that have been happening around us in, in, in the, in, in the country, not COVID notwithstanding and all kinds of other things. But it seems like, you know, when I first showed up, we were at Ibar every Sunday and, you know, there was a few shows happening here and there, but mo- like so we would all see each other on like a very regular basis because we had this like one place where we were just guaranteed to run into each other every uh, every week. But, uh, you know, after Ibar shut down, what I, I personally noticed was that all of a sudden, you know, a, 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 people were just forced to do d- to be productive because we d- d- <laughs> didn't have that social, <laughs> you know, social nucleus. And it seemed like in that one uh, in that one year, all of a sudden, people started playing shows here, starting projects there, and doing stuff. So, like, do you do you have any sense of how how things really evolved, like in that in that time? Because for me, I feel like there's a huge huge difference. Yeah, I think like a few key moments happened, like Blue Frog and Iba shut down, mm-hmm. um, and I think those two venues were like where you would meet. Yeah. Like you said, like every week or every two weeks, you'd see people. You, if you go there at any given time, you will meet a bunch of people you know. Yeah. Um, and I mean, new venues have come up, but there's not been anything that is as iconic or hasn't reached that iconic status yet where it's like um, everyone will be there at all points yeah. of time. At, at a social like level, said, at a social level, we don't have, we don't quite have something like that where you just go there and you just know you're going to meet. 90% of everybody that you know. Yeah. But I don't know whether that's a definitely a terrible thing. I mean, it's terrible that these places shut down because I love them. Yeah. And um, like, uh, but uh, I think, I think it's a, it's kind of a good thing because the Bombay scene became more of a social thing than for the music at some point. Um, well, yeah, I mean, there was yeah. a balance, but I think the balance skewed towards like being a social interaction rather than going and checking out new music or going and um, like trying to absorb new music. Uh, so yeah. more, like, well, that's you, what I was getting at. Like as soon as Ibar shut down in that within that year is, is when so many new projects just emerged, it seemed. Yeah. yeah and and yeah. previous projects that were already established also started to like, you know, pick up steam a, yeah. as well or, or regain steam that had previously been lost yeah i i think like venues coming and going is always going to be part of a thing but um just being productive is difficult man you there's so many things to to like resist the productivity of a person you know like Mm -hmm. um and uh, i i think those places shutting down took away a lot of that resistance so it's like you don't have to go out on a friday night you can you can just sit at home and work on something um, and I think also the yep, scene is true. getting... And I mean, I certainly started nesting. After I was shot, I it was nested heavily, right? Like I, all of a sudden I was just going out way less. And I mean, we started the, this conversation saying I haven't seen you in, in ages. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. co- that's COVID. But even before COVID, I hadn't actually seen you in quite some time. Yeah. And uh, we've all, I mean, I've gotten really used. And say even uh, our, our mutual friend, Jason, right? Like <laughs> we just kind of got used to just sit, being at home. And, uh, you know, being productive in our own ways or sometimes not being productive, but just being at home. Um, but th- so you, you mentioned, uh, like I, I brought up iBarb and then you also mentioned Blue Frog and those in a, uh, to me, uh, those are two, two fairly different types of places, but also, uh, like the Blue Frog has a, a legacy that is maybe quite different than iBar. Would I be correct in saying that? Mm-hmm. Maybe, uh, it, definitely. Maybe it would be helpful to say something a bit about that legacy, uh, uh, you know, for any listeners who may not be familiar with uh, with that. I think Blue Frog was one of the coolest venues we were we've ever had in mm-hmm. Bombay. Like there were there have been a few venues in my my mind. Um, like B Six Nine was one of them, and Blue Frog is another one. And it's just mm-hmm. such great music. Like so many awesome acts that would come there and play. Um, and just like tons of memories, but like, I think towards the end of Blue Frog's life, you would see more people outside the venue than inside the venue when, when a band was playing. So I I think, I think the, that we, we started making this culture that wasn't like super great for music, but I mean, I guess that's okay. You're coming to meet people and go and check out one song when you want to come out. That's fine. If, if that's how you want to enjoy the music, that's fine. 
Um, but I th- yeah. I also well the social aspect is important. Yeah, it is important, man. Like that's that's kind of brings a a big level of enjoyment to it, right? You get to meet friends, you get to have a drink. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, I think I made a very uh, what what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a decision. Basically, I made a decision um, to to not go out as much and not go to uh, venues as much. And even though um, I missed some of that. Uh, checking out bands and like chilling with people uh i really started being a lot more productive and could focus on a lot more things and even if i went to a venue i would be like okay cool i'm gonna drink only water tonight yeah. and try that out um so i uh, i mean i made like those decisions to try and be more productive for myself so i can't really speak to what, what made everybody else more productive but i i know that that's what helped me I think I think a lot of people experienced that. I mean, well, it was two two thousand seventeen, right? It was when like I I bar closed right at the beginning of that that year, and I think yeah, a lot of people found themselves in a similar situation. It's actually a tough balance, but I know that there are some artists that are really productive and really well respected, and you never see them at at, at mm-hmm. anywhere. Like, um, and uh, I, I you know I. I you could list off a few names. I, I won't maybe ne- I won't necessarily attempt to list off names, lest you know I make a incorrect assessment. But there are <laughs> there there are as as far as I've noticed, especially back when I was more social. There there are artists that I would never see around, but then they you know they're they're just putting out all kinds of music. And then especially when I was new. You, uh, people would be like, oh, you need to meet this person. This person's really amazing. You'd, you'd really hit it off with them. But then I'd, I'd never have the opportunity because they would literally never be at any type of event or po- party or social gathering. Uh, and there is, uh, you, you can see that, pe- you know, removing yourself from that, you can allow yourself to be very productive. And um, I experienced that, like in 2017, I had an album to mix. And so I was at home doing that. And then just just around the time I finished that, then I got the chance to do the Cognac Net album, which was again, that was that was when my excuses for not socializing really, really started to pick up. Like I, on any given evening, I could have just been working on that record rather than being going rather than going out, and it was such an important project for me. So I would almost always just choose to uh, to stay in or you know stay in or be at Jason's studio, kind of working on that record. So the productivity stuff is really, it really helps, but I definitely do miss the socializing and also like the, the, it, those connections are important to fostering, to fostering the scene, right? Like if people don't actually show up and socialize, then yeah, eventually what, what happens? You just have a bunch of people in silos making music and nobody's talking to anybody else. And that, that, mm-hmm. that can also be quite weird. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, it's it, it makes sense now. I mean, uh, when I think about it, right? Like we we haven't seen each other so much over the last couple of years, not as often as we would have in like the first few years that I was here. Uh, and it makes sense mm-hmm. that we're all off in our own corner doing stuff. And now, of course, there's this COVID situation, so we're all forced into isolation. And for some people, that's really great. For me, it's it's been a boon. I really needed the world to slow down. I had lots of stuff that I need to catch up on. Um, what, what have you been doing during this time? Like, have you been, have you had stuff to keep yourself busy? Yeah. So, um, a couple of these projects, right? Like, so drum house, we're doing our new drum camp that's happening in August. Um, I, uh, have, uh, um, I have this new project, Dino Siren coming out, um, mm-hmm. as well. So like a lot of new lessons, man, just like figuring out how to release your own music. Cause I've always been part of a team right here it's mm-hmm. a way smaller team it's just Ishan and I um, mm-hmm. so I've just been figuring out all of this new stuff um, also like trying to work on stuff that I should have been working on a long time ago like recording myself um, for like these sessions so now all the sessions I'm getting are not in studios anymore right they're all yeah. home recording so I have to figure out how to get better at that um, then we're doing a lot of 
like a lot of random but fun stuff. So we did this little cover of the Strokes song. Um, I heard that. Yeah, it take, sounds great. Uh, taken for a fool. Yeah. So, yeah. So I worked on like my video editing chops with that because I was like, okay, cool. Uh, I need to I need to know how to edit videos if I want to create content for Drum House or Dino Siren or whatever it is, right? So. Uh, he called up Jishnu a bunch of times, asked him for tips, yeah. and I uh, helped him trouble. Like he helped me troubleshoot everything that I needed to troubleshoot, uh, and yeah. got done with that edit, which was like a big moment for me. It was like, oh wow, I managed to do this. Um, but um, yeah, just like working on peripheral skills, I guess a lot of peripheral skills. That's super important. Mm-hmm. I mean, I look at me. I'm over here doing a podcast, and uh, you know, <laughs> like I, j- j- having having these. Uh, peripheral skills, side hustles, um, and it all connects together. You can always like yeah, put it together to make something, uh, you know, bigger than you were expecting. Bigger might be the wrong way to to express the the concept I'm trying to get across. How are you doing, Drumhouse? Uh, I mean, in the midst of the pandemic, what does how how is that working for you? So so we're doing a virtual camp this year. Like I was one day away from putting the down payment on the venue for the actual camp Mm -hmm. before the lockdown happened. Yeah. So I, um, thankfully the timing was right where I didn't have to spend a bunch of money and like throw it away. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, um, I'm really sad that we didn't get to do that. Right. I mean, I'm, everybody has lost a lot of work and different types of projects during Mm -hmm. this, this whole COVID situation. Um, but it, personally, it was a really big bummer for me that, that that camp couldn't happen. So we figured out a way to make it happen as a virtual camp that's happening on the four, from the 14th to 16th of August. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's going like, we're going to try and make it as close to the offline camp. I guess that's what we're going to call it now. The offline <laughs> camp as uh, possible. Um, but, uh, there are some advantages to learning online. I mean, there are a few disadvantages also. Obviously, you don't get to like, physically interact with people but um, you can see what they're doing you can like instruct well enough online um, over video but there are also some advantages because we'll have like these different camera angles where you can see exactly what somebody's foot is doing when they're playing something oh, you know yeah, cool. uh, like you know so you get you get this different perspective of what how they're playing and how they're managing to do stuff so with with all of the the shit that's going on, at least that's like some something good to look forward to, where you can yeah. still ha- make like quality education online and try try to try to do this camp online. So I'm really excited for that. Yeah, there's there's, there's lots like the the adjustments and adaptations that we have to make. I mean, maybe we can even take them with us to the post COVID scenario if if we make it there. Mm-hmm. Um, have you done like online lessons, like one on one lessons before for drums? Is that something you've done before? Uh, no, I started as soon as COVID hit, though. Like within within a week of the lockdown, I was uh, doing online lessons, and um, it's it's definitely been a learning process. But I think I've figured out a like a decent enough way to make things happen because all my lessons are group lessons. I don't don't do too many one on one private lessons. Okay, I, I love like like I said, I'm I'm a social person, so I enjoy the social aspect of drumming. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so I think. Or I need to have group lessons to, to enjoy them, um, to get the most enjoyment from them. Um, so anyway, uh, basically figured out how to make group lessons work on a, on, in an online situation, which was kind of difficult. But now I think I got a, like a smooth flow happening. So I'm really happy yeah. about that. And so you've been able to test out this like different camera angles type thing in, in that scenario? Not so for what I do usually in my lessons, I need just one camera angle because it's it's not mm-hmm. it's not so um, relevant to have a bunch of camera angles. But the other teachers who are on this lesson, so we have we have Jero Kavi, G- Gino Banks, and um, and uh, Darshan Doshi. Sorry, um, sorry, I just I, I spaced out there because I was like, is it Jero Kavi or J Rao Kavi? And I realized it's J Rao Kavi. <laughs> Ka- and is it Kavi or Kavi? I, no. I should have maybe it's checked tough. this out at we some point. We struggle with life. each other's names even <laughs> over here. It should give it should give all the the non non Indians some some solace, right? Like the, because uh, what yeah. people don't realize about India is that it's basically a continent, right? It, it gets marketed as a country, but it's just this huge diverse re- region that's sort of like <laughs> Europe. And so 
We all we will often struggle with each other's names. Like your like your last name is uh, it's what uh, uh, a Malayali last name? No, right. That is correct. That is, yeah. This is thinking about it is like that is correct. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, but that's the thing, and, and like the 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 languages in the south are so different. So when us uh, pe- people like uh, like me who have a North Indian background, we'll struggle to wrap our head around those names. And then of of course I'm a Bengali person, so we have a. A Hindiized version of of my name, but then the weird, like long Bengali vowels can freak people out uh, in in other parts of the country. So it, it's you know, if if you're a non-Indian listening to this, even even us Indians struggle to say each other's names sometimes. <laughs> you know, yeah. Is it is it Arnab or Nob Arnob? Like it's or, 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 always uh, Bengali would be Arnob. And uh, hmm. I find I find even I find that awkward to say in the midst of speaking English. Like in the midst of speaking Bengali, it yeah. kind of rolls yeah. off the, the the tongue. But in the yeah in English, it's you have to like flip a switch in your brain to to say it. Uh, and then you know our, our, our nub, which is what I default to. Uh, and anyone that's listened to the podcast, any other episodes, I've I've spoken about this a few times now. Um, cool man. Uh, so. Like what? What else have you been up to? Like besides music, music things? Um, not much, man. Like it's it's been like just trying to deal with the isolation. I think that's been a big, big one. Just trying to figure out yeah. how to still like. Cause I probably said it a few times here already, but I I thrive in social situations. I enjoy being yeah. a social person. So this has been kind of hard for me. Like, I, so I'm just trying to work that out. Um, and a lot of t- like, I've been super busy with uh, a bunch of different things. So uh, the time I have to chill is usually just watching trash shows on Netflix. Um, <laughs> so I've been watching a lot, lot of trash <laughs> But it's been so, fun. Like Indian matchmaking is the last thing I watched, and that was amazing. Oh man, that's been trash. pretty controversial, hey? I loved it. Like it's been people are talking about this. You love I it? I loved it. I loved it. I loved everything about it. I haven't seen it, obviously, <laughs> but but uh, I've just seen some of the various think pieces and opinions that have been floating around about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, wh- why, why don't you tell me about it a little bit? Um, so the premise of the show is uh, about this matchmaker who hooks up arranged marriages right mm-hmm. um and they follow the lives of these different characters the uh, people basically um they follow them and like from the moment that they are presented with the match to the date and everything um yeah but it's just such a i i i really enjoyed the show because it is what it is you know I yeah. mean, it's like I, I've seen a lot of those pieces of people judging it and being like, oh, this is such a regressive system and whatever like their opinions are about it. Mm-hmm. But it, it just is what it is like now. Well, that is know, a reality for some I, people. I watched it like that. It, it yeah. is. It, yeah. it's, it's weird. Uh, so, I, so I kind of. It's weird because it is a reality for some people, uh, like a very real kind of thing, a very real. And many people sort of plan out their lives in accordance with the, with this type of scenario, you know, like they're plan out their careers and their life path mm-hmm. with the knowledge that, you know, they're, they're going to have an, a, an arranged marriage. And then, and, and oh, well, that's kind of, I mean, again, I haven't seen the show, but it's kind of why I have like a, a mixed feeling about it because on the one hand it, sh- it shows and demonstrates a real thing that's prevalent, um, you know, in society. But then on the other hand, especially, you know, being Canadian, you, you, and this is something that people have seen around the world now. So you, you don't necessarily want to create the impression that this is what everybody's life is like here or that this is what everybody is doing. That's the, the, yeah. the flip, flip side of it. But yeah, a lot of people, um, even, even people we might know, right? Yeah, of um, course. Of course. Yeah, and I know people yeah. who are really happy with their arranged marriages. Like, so, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, it's like Tinder, just yeah. a little more sophisticated yeah. than Tinder. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's interesting you say that about satisfaction because I remember reading uh, is this book called the I think is the name of the book is the Art of Choosing. I could be wrong about it that the precise title of the book, but it it there was a study done uh, like it was a a long I don't know what the technical term is, but it was a study done over a long period of time, many many years. Like people had to pick pick up the research as 
uh, you know, as the original people that started the, the study kind of had to retire or whatever. And they kind of, I think this was done in J- Jaipur, Rajasthan. And they polled, they sort of surveyed people who had sort of what we call love marriages and also arranged marriages. And they asked people at the beginning of this study kind of their level of satisfaction or, um, yeah, just general level of satisfaction with their partner for the love marriages and the arranged marriage at the beginning of the marriage. And then they f- kept following up with these these people until they were, you know, in their 60s or whatever. And then they asked them the same question. And what they found w- w- with the couples that managed to stay together, what they found was that the people who had love marriages, they rated their satisfaction in their partner extremely highly in the beginning, like in the in the 80s and 90s. And then by the time, you know, they were in their 60s, the the satisfaction in their partner was quite low, you know, like down in the you know, 30s and 40s, that kind of thing. With the love marriages, the satisfaction with the, the partner was it started off quite low or like kind of neutral. So maybe started off, again, I'm not quoting the numbers properly so that I could be wrong about that, but they started off kind of lower. But by the end, uh, when they were asked again, you know, when they were in their 60s and stuff, the, the satisfaction had gone up quite a bit. So that that really says something about expectation and then how yeah. uh, expectation matches up with reality. And that is something that's worth knowing about arranged marriages, whether you're from India or whether you're kind of from abroad and you're hearing about this, this whole concept of arranged marriage. Because th- there's obviously plenty of scope for for those things to just go haywire and go wrong. But then there are a lot of other people who... I, I don't know what the right way to say it is. They sort of accept the role or a- accept the, the reality of what their situation is. It's like, okay, this is an arranged marriage. We have a household. We have to make this thing work. And if they manage to stick t- together, then by the time, you know, they get to the end of their, their lives, they, there's this like solidarity that they have. Now, like that's not saying anything about the, in, in both the love marriages and the arranged marriages, there's all kinds of things that can happen. There's divorces, you know, there's, there's abusive relationships. Those manifest themselves in in different ways uh in in those types of relationships but so that's the interesting thing about this uh matchmaker show is that it puts a spotlight on this particular thing that is sort of a stereotype about our culture um and you know i I mean i have mixed feelings about it. It, it it's real it's obviously real and pervasive so it's there's no point hiding hiding that fact and it's kind of nice to have a lighthearted yeah. take on it um yeah. But uh, yeah, I haven't seen the show, so I, I can't comment any further than that. <laughs> it's a it's a really fun watch. I, yeah. I think everyone should watch it. Yeah, it's really fun, man. It's it's a bit cringy, but it's like I enjoyed it. I got like deep into it. Found out about everyone's lives on the show after that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. cringe can be fun, right? Cringe. That's the thing with cringe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how would you, do? Do you think that like? Uh, like let's say people that we might know people that we might encounter in our in our social circle how similar is that scenario with regards to to people in our in our social circle would you say um i'm sure like i probably not super close to anyone in my immediate social circle right now but but it could happen and i don't see I don't see a big problem with it. I mean, I, I, there's a problem with certain attitudes and certain like yeah. expectations of what women should be like or what men should be like and fair is beautiful and like stupid stuff like that. Um, there's obviously a problem with that those That stuff things. is bullshit. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, but in general, the whole matchmaking process, I think is, is pretty cool. I think, um, I think one of the reasons, and this is complete speculation and opinion that these couples stay together for longer is because like... The decision you're making is vet- vetted by your whole family, by everyone like mm-hmm. who's involved, you know, in this process. It's a, it's like you're making a conscious decision right at the start. Okay, I'm going to spend the rest of my life with this person and we're going to make it work. Yeah. And I think that expectation is set so strongly early on that I feel, yeah. feel like maybe those arranged marriages um, last or 
are more satisfactory because you go in knowing that when you yeah. start a new relationship you start off by not knowing what the outcome of this relationship is going to be most likely mm-hmm. right and then it finally it kind of evolves into okay i'm sure i want to spend the rest of my life with this person and um that that's a that's a decision you made all by yourself right and then after yeah. that you look for people's approval and i i feel like you could mm-hmm. question a decision you made all by yourself way easier than questioning a decision that is approved by a bunch of people beforehand including yeah. yourself you know um yeah. so i think i think um that's an advantage of it i guess maybe um, yeah you know i wouldn't so i wouldn't shy I, away i know it ha- i know friends who've got done it yeah i mean me too and i i wouldn't shy away from saying that there are actually advantages too to that. Like it's not something that mm-hmm. I would imagine for myself, but I can definitely see certain advantages of it. I think I think part of what uh what accounts for the success of arranged marriages is also the mindset that goes into it, right? Like Yeah. There's a mindset, but also people who are more uh here at least traditionally oriented with regards to marriage. I mean, they don't just view it as like a union between two people. A lot of people view it as like a union between two families. So that also right adds this like sort of social w- weight to the thing you know like it's 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 it, mm-hmm. it's a merger of two families whereas in the in the west we're so individualistic so oftentimes it's not viewed in that way and so it it's it's it you know at least superficially easier to uh, break off in, in that way that's uh, that's pretty yeah. uh, pretty interesting do you, there's also a lot of intermediary intermediate yeah intermediate type situations where it's like kind of a quasi arranged thing you know like Mm -hmm. i I don't even know how to describe it have you encountered this at all like i think i have a few friends where it was like you almost feel like it was like a half arranged marriage like the parents kind of loosely set it up and then it's like okay you guys go and date and do figure it out like have you seen that at all so even on the show even on this show it's kind of that's what it is yeah. it's all like this it's just a matchmaker setting two people up by showing them like showing them bio data and then they date and they try to see whether it works out yeah um spoiler that none of the couples ended up working out yeah well then yeah. it's very much like tinder yeah we talked about indian matchmaking yeah. for a really long time <laughs> that's cool i like those tangents i mean unless you want me to yeah. edit that out but the in, in no 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 i in a certain in a certain kind of way like the that's more the fun part of the podcast like yeah of course i i like to a- i like to ask people about i like to ask people about the the projects they're involved in and that's that's super cool and i want people to get to know all the different cool projects that are going on but the the random tangents and diversions that occur in the conversation are are more fun and more interesting mm-hmm. at the end of the day like i'm sure somebody else will also ask you at some point about you know music education or you know the cognac net or yeah, yeah. any any number of these things but the um <laughs> the the weird uh the weird turns that the conversation takes that's kind of the more more of the fun part hello hello yeah so, i'm wondering i'm wondering when uh when this whole lockdown situation is going to end we're in like lockdown 6 now at this point fuck i've stopped keeping track of those numbers man yeah it's 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 crazy um and i'm just like wondering when things are going to get back to normal because the numbers are still going up i i think right yeah yeah, yeah i think i think it's not going to get back to normal for a while because like uh, that it's Uh, we have such a huge population and it's yeah. so hard to manage and mm-hmm. it's just like it's going to get worse way worse before it gets better i think yeah and we're the you know, uh, we're the worst hit city in the country i think still so it's it's a little yeah. bit it's a little bit uh unsettling i you know when when all this started i had i i don't think any of us had any idea how long it was going to go on but uh, you know especially i i got lots of work to keep me busy but i'm also starting to feel the isolation like this all you know if you had like i think you called me close to the beginning of lockdown mm-hmm. and even like even then i was like man i haven't seen you in ages and normally like the i haven't seen you in ages is easily rectified by like getting in a rick and going over to your place Let's and meet. yeah but it's like now it's like man when are we going to get to like hang out again properly and um that 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 that's weird to think about i now how i don't know how many months we've been in this now i'm starting to lose track but i'm starting to miss this freedom yeah. that i can just go and see anybody whenever i want 
Have you met anyone in this lockdown? Yeah, I have met. Uh, there was a brief period where there was some freedom of mobility. There is some freedom of, of mobility, but there's a brief period in, in the middle where I went to meet Krell a couple of times. Nice. But then, then like the the situation just started to see it was get worse again. It was always getting worse, mm. but like the information that that's coming to us is so, it, it, you know, it's it's so patchy. So then, it, yeah, like things seemed like they were getting worse again. So I haven't been out of the house. So I, I went to see Krell a few times, probably in June. And um, mm. yeah, I've just been in been in the house since since then. My mom was here with me, right? And my mom. Yeah, did she go back? She went back at the yeah at the end of June, and I was not necessarily a big okay proponent of her flying back in the middle of all this. Mm -hmm. She did. She was getting antsy over here. Um, and so she's back in Calcutta now. She seems safe uh, from what I can gather. Um, so now I'm like actually properly by myself in the house. It was good to have mom around because like normally, like pretty much always I'm visiting her. That's always the case is I'm visiting mm -hmm. her. And, and so yeah. it was the first time yeah. where she's had to visit me on my turf and, you know, being an artist like it and, and, you know, my mom's so much older than I am, you know, extra generation uh, older. So there's always this sense like she doesn't understand what I do. It's easy for her to think that maybe I don't really do much. Uh -huh. But li living with me here for what it, I think it was like something like three and a half, four months, she got to see like a, a, actually how much work goes into the, the various things that I do, whether it's like music production or or voiceovers. Or just, I mean, this podcast started when she was still here. Okay. So she's just seeing that I, I'm, I, I take all this like sort of initiative to, to do all these random things. So I think that really helped in terms of uh, communicating to her that, you know, it's not just a bunch of ephemeral, you know, nonsensical. Yeah. Not just wasting my time here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also like with, with the types of projects, I mean, I'm finally getting to the point with with stuff now where people reach out to me to to collaborate or work on stuff on on a variety of things that's awesome yeah man. it's good that's i mean awesome. we, that was the goal like it's always been the goal yeah i mean it's 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 great but it's also i mean i i'm happy about that but it, that's sort of been in the works for a while but it's good that 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 my mother got to see that because again that sort of nice it communicates to 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 your parent who's obviously very worried about you but has doesn't understand what you do at all it gave her a chance to sort of understand uh, what what it is I do, and it, it it also helped her understand my weird sleeping hours because my mom is this type of person. Mm. She's like super, like she's the type of person that that thinks you're like a morally inferior person if you like sleep past Wait, eight eight or nine a.m. Like if you're sleeping past nine a.m. in the <laughs> morning, you're you're a morally deficient person. That's usually kind of her. Uh, she, I mean, she would have done really well in the military, like in a different life, she would have done really well in the army. But um, what what she saw in terms of my sleeping hours, like it's different when I'm in Calcutta because I just don't have all this stuff that I'm actively working on in a very visible kind of way. But in in my own home, mm -hmm. she's just forced to see that I'm like, it's not just like I'm up at night, just like, you know, doing nothing. Like I'm constantly working on stuff. So that was, that that was good. She got, to, I think she finally understands that sort of I, as an artist, I keep weird hours and, and I have to, you know, mm. if I, if I can't get to sleep, then it, Man, I have to do some work, you know, that kind of thing. After I've been trying to be much better about that, like the sleep, like I, I read this book called um, Why We Sleep. Right. I think that's mm -hmm. what it's called. Um, and it really changed my like opinions on how to best like cater your sleeping habits, like and make sure that they're healthy sleeping habits, you know. So I've been trying to be a lot better about that. It's easier said than done, obviously, but um, it really is, especially with been, our lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. So I've been trying to get eight hours at least and still make it up in the morning. And by morning, I just mean before 12 o'clock if i wake yeah. up before 12 o'clock i have succeeded <laughs> yeah for for a freelancer and particularly for an artist i mean i, I mm -hmm. you know as, I, musicians especially because like you know gigs and stuff sometimes push our push our sleeping time later even when we don't want it to be or sometimes like collaborations are such that like okay the only time somebody's free is late so i mean that's the kind mm -hmm. of thing that sort of messes with my sleeping schedule all the time i 
I know that like if you don't have a regular sleeping time, like it, it, it can it can add up and have some negative health effects later on down the line. Yeah. And so I'm I'm struggling to figure it out because I just go through this thing where my sleep schedule just always fluctuates. Like the entire time that I've been a freelancer, it's always like I've just never had a fixed sleeping time, and it always. You know, it's just one hour later, one hour later, every, like your bedtime just keeps shifting one hour later until, yeah, you know, yeah, it, over yeah. the course of three weeks, every hour in the day has been your bedtime at some point. And it's always the worst when, when, when your bedtime is in the afternoon, like when that happens, like, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's mm. funny that, you, that, that we're talking about this because I was, I was sleeping pretty late, but I was waking up until today. I was waking up somewhere around 12. 12, 1230 mm. was when I, around when I was waking up and I was like not super happy about that. And I was trying to push my bedtime back a bit so that I could wake up before noon. Um, and what happened last night was that I just, I fell asleep, I think, but just by accident, I guess I had a meal that made me feel sleepy or whatever. I fell asleep at like, I think 10 PM. And then I woke up at 5 a.m. And I've been awake since 5 a.m. Oh, no. Uh, and, and, and I mean, it's what? It's, it's, almost, it's almost 3 o'clock now. So I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I was expecting that maybe I was going to like fall asleep again before this podcast started. I was like worried about my mental capability to, to carry on this conversation. Yeah. I was like thinking <laughs> about all those things. But then I was like, no, 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 no. I'm just going to have to stay awake and, you know, I'm just going to have a, a bunch of coffees and, right. and, and do it. But uh, sleep is super important, man. Getting it sorted is super important. Yeah. I worry about it because I don't see my lifestyle changing in terms of being a freelancer, creative in quotation marks type. And you should read this book. Yeah, who's it by? You should definitely read this book, Why We Sleep. Um, I don't remember the author, but I'll send you a link. Cool, cool. I, so I did the audio book and it was great. Like it really like... I, it's helped me a lot just understanding better mm -hmm. like understanding sleep better yeah no it's important for your brain i mean your brain needs that time to to rejuvenate so they say the last two hours of your sleep are the most important so like really the seventh and eighth hour are the apparently the most important for like function oh, so wow. uh so you should try and get that eight hours of sleep and i mean he goes into detail about it but like um, that was one of the biggest things that I got from it is like, try and get those eight hours. Oh, I, I'm going to have to get on top of that. I'm wondering if I get eight hours or not. I kind of envy those people who can just sort of get by on less sleep. There's like cer there's a certain mm. class of people that just... So even in the book, like he talks about this and um, people get by on less sleep, but uh, it's like he, he compares it to you are more likely to get struck by lightning than be a person who is... <laughs> okay with getting less than uh, than eight hours of sleep that's um, good to know that's very so, good to know yeah. yeah yeah so it's like even the people who are doing it it's it's not beneficial for them and they're running they're like basically fucking up their battery life or like whatever their brain life i don't know why i thought battery life is just because i stared at my laptop no right that's now. good i mean it's like <laughs> but yeah i yeah. i've heard that it's supposed to have pretty negative effects for your brain and i really i really worry about that because yeah. i mean I've obviously, I've got a history of dementia in my family from my, from my father's side. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried about that. I'm trying to figure out what lifestyle changes I can make now to offset that for as long as possible or, you know, it, avoid it if I can, but just push it, push it into the future as much yeah. as, uh, as much as possible. So the brain health thing worries me because the brain, I mean, you know, my thinking is all I got. I'm, I'm not a genius, but I certainly don't, I certainly don't make up for it with, uh, with physical strength or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I've been also trying to put some lifestyle changes into effect, like just like yoga, intermittent fasting is still going, which is like, yeah? I think that's been one of the biggest boons in my life, you know, cause like that discipline of 10 How long PM, have you been doing that? I guess, I don't know, man. I, I'm not good with timelines, but maybe over a year, over a year and a half. Oh, maybe. Is that, I mean, yeah, that, um, that's a, that's a substantial amount of time. I've, whenever I've managed to do it, like I, you I feel great. I mean, it's, it's, it's really good. And I mean, I fall off of these yeah. things really easily, but when I'm, when I manage to get on something like an inter intermittent fasting, it's, it's, yeah, it mm -hmm. feels, feels fantastic. For me, it's like less of a diet and more of a discipline. Like it's something, it's something else that I am in control of, mm -hmm. which, I, which appeals to me, I guess. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, 
It's been really, really helpful. And if I, I feel like if I can get that under control, there's no reason I can't get my sleep under control. And if I can get my sleep under control, there's no reason I can't get my productivity under control. So it's like slowly building up to to other aspects of my life and making them better. No, you can do it. You can definitely do it. And I mean, the whole, yeah. the idea of waking up before 12 works for a musician because you have to keep yeah. that, keep it in mind that like, you know, I mean, presumably when, when we're in the post-COVID world, you're still going to be playing shows. Shows will still happen, yeah. you know, later in the night. So you have to give yourself that, that amount of leeway. But, uh, you know, there, there, there are some creative professions where you, you can... And, and I mean, some people, it's not as if like across the board, all freelance creative types just stay up late. Like there's a, bu- a whole different category of people that really function well in the morning. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, from a creative point of view, I would like to become one of those people, but I'm still the type of person that I just get so much more done at night. Yeah. 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 I I feel like I have a lot more energy at night for some reason. Like I just like, I, I want like the drive. I think it's kind of, Oh, I've wasted the whole day in like in certain ways. Mm -hmm. It's like, Oh, I've wasted the whole day. I need to start doing stuff now. And then that pressure kind of builds up to the point where you're like, okay, cool. I'll go. And then next thing you know, it's like four in the morning and you've, you've just got done doing whatever you're doing. Well, I like, I like easing into the day as well. Right. Like for me, like I, I I remember back when I had normal civilian jobs, you know, I just hated the whole idea of like waking up early to just get on public transport to get into the office and like you know just Mm -hmm. haphazardly get like that was always brutal and so once i quit that lifestyle i mean i like waking up making a cup of coffee you know i mean recently probably for the last year i mean i discovered podcasts and like uh, properly like in the last year and a half i'd say and so i like you know, waking up in the, when I, when, whenever it is I wake up, let's call it the morning, uh, you know, waking up whenever you wake, wake up, have a coffee, uh, have a joint if I have stash and just listen to a lecture or a podcast at a nice, easy pace before podcasts. It used to be reading. And like ever since I, I this is a change I've implemented in the last week because I'm ever since I started listening to more podcasts and lectures and sort of like video essays and those types of things on YouTube that I like to watch. Um, I noticed that my reading has gone way down. Mm. And so I, I, I've sort of recently exhausted a lot of podcast and, and video essay type content. I'm like, I found, I found myself in the morning sort of like scrolling and I was like, I I've seen this. I already know this, you know, that kind of thing. And then I realized, man, I used to read like every morning I would make a cup of coffee and I would, I would read something. And so uh, I'm trying to get back into into reading, nice, um, uh, reading a bit more. But that's kind of how I like to start my day. Like I like to start ease into my day by doing things like reading or, or taking in some some information, maybe learning something. Um, and then like later in the day is when I start to get productive and stuff. It I don't know how sustainable that is, right? Like I I I, yeah. I feel like at some point the real world is going to interfere with that and be like, no, you have to you have to conform to the to the schedule that everyone's everyone else is in. But the thing with, with the, the pandemic is that that's really it, it, everybody's sense of what a normal schedule is, has been totally messed up, you know? Yeah. True. True. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny. Like people, uh, like I've been talking to a few of my friends, um, and they, they're, they're just so surprised about this whole working from home, and there, th- some of them are really amazed by it and, and excited about the fact that, wow, you can work from home and I didn't even know. And then other people are really struggling to organize their day um, mm-hmm. all, all by themselves. Yeah. And uh, I've just, I mean, we, we've been doing that kind of thing for ages. So it's pretty, yeah. it, that not much has changed in that regard, right? Um, so it's... Yeah, work-wise, like, other than the fact that gigs have stopped, mm-hmm. not much has changed. Like, everything else is, is exactly how it was. Yep. yeah. Do what do you think? Do you, what do you think is how, like? How do you think this is going to affect music? That like, you know, forget shows. I mean, even even shows, but just even like say the the whole process of making music. Like you were talking about, like tracking drums from your home, so people are now recording remotely and sent like that. That's just taken off, right? Like in the middle of the yeah of course. Of, of the lockdown around the world, people are just tracking themselves at home and sending it off. Um, and you know, 
new content is like emerging in that way. And then there's this whole thing of like live streaming shows. What, have you seen yeah. any of these live stream shows? I've seen some tests that I know um, like some some friends are doing like tests of live streaming shows mm-hmm. and they've sounded pretty killer actually. They sound really, really good. Um, so I'm excited to see what that brings. And I, I think post-COVID, the what I am envisioning is, you know, like you see, watch all these like YouTube shows like Triple J and um, KEXP and they have all those sessions, right, going on. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that so many people would have figured out how to make sessions like that in India. Um, and I'm hoping some of the guys like from Island City or Glass Onion start making content like that um, that can be like seen across the world, you know? I think, um, yeah. I, well, I think we're going to get a new... Uh, the, the whole idea of streaming shows or even just making... Even if they're not live, like I think there's this new emerging third category of thing. Like we've got our recordings, right? Like, you know, making proper produced sort of recordings. Then you've got like actual live shows, which I assume will come back at some point. And then there's this whole like other space of, you know, performances that can happen online, whether they're streamed or not. And I guess even the technology yeah. around streaming is going gonna, is gonna to get refined, hopefully, as long as civil, I, civilization doesn't collapse. I in the really interim. can't wait for them to um, make a program that allows you to play with people like in real time. Yeah. An easily accessible program because there are a few, but like something that's easy that I can just, I, I want to pay you money to give me this program. Anybody <laughs> like just make my life way easier, just even for classes well, I think, and for, but, for, to play with people, man. Mm-hmm. Well, the, the hardest part is it's, it's like the, from the soft, there's the software problem, but then the, the there's also the connection and connectivity problem, right? Like yeah. you can make the best piece of software, but if the connection fucks up, then that's that there, there, there's that hurdle. Right. And right. right. There's going to be like, okay, let's say, let's, let's assume that the five G conspiracies are wrong. And then eventually we get five G like there's, <laughs> that's supposed to revolutionize this whole, even what we're doing right now. Right. It's supposed to revolutionize right. that. Um, but uh, yeah, like it's, it's going to be interesting to see where that goes once the technology improves both from the connectivity point point of view. I mean, I think once you get the once you get the speed of connection, then the software should be relatively simple to um, no. to develop. We probably have have already have the technology from the software point of view. I think it, it comes down more to the quality of the connection and making sure that's you know. I guess I'm I don't know. no. So like I think some of the programs and how they've been working, I think is like a, a, they have algorithms that kind of. Uh, figure out what the delay is and eliminate it. Yeah. So you can hear it in real time, which is um, that that I think that messes really with cool. my whole concept of what time even is. Like you know, this is yeah. not totally related. It's it's a different phenomenon. But like, let's say we're having this conversation over this this video call right now, and you're gonna send me the audio from your end, and then when I dump in the audio, like there's so there's I, I mean I'm not sure what's ha- been happening on your side, but s- certainly while you've been talking to me, as as is the case with audio, these uh, Wi-Fi calls, every now and then there's a little bit of a weird delay thing, and then yeah. in the middle of your word it gets stretched and stuff like that, and then it's always really interesting when I get the audio from from the other end, and then I dump dump it in. And you look at the two, and then after a while they go out of sync because these little delays start to add up, right? Mm-hmm. And that yeah. that is a, I- interesting, like it messes with your concept of what time even is. Uh, yeah. But I- I- in terms of what you're talking about, in terms of like a like, live performance, it's like, yeah, it's going to figure out the delay and account for that. So it's going to figure out what the, 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 the overall delay is in the audio, but then how is it going to account for those glitches, mm-hmm. which we still experience, right? So I don't know, but it's like, uh, I know some people who are doing it like Darshan Doshi has this project called Live and In Sync, mm-hmm. where they're playing in sync, like they're playing live on, on a stream in their own, in like separate studios or whatever. Um, so it's possible. I it's, know it's, it's possible. possible. I, I just, I, I wonder how you could guarantee that you wouldn't get these weird like the, the, yeah. those momentary glitches, right? It's like one thing if there's like yeah. a a delay that's consistent over the whole, the time of yeah, the, the yeah, span yeah, of the whole yeah. thing. But it's, it's these momentary glitches that, I mean, 
uh, like, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, have you been having those glitches, hearing those glitches? Of yeah, course. Right? Like when of I'm, course. yeah. So that, that is, uh, that's the one that is leaving me scratching my head a little bit. Mm. Um, because like, imagine if it gets to the, I mean, you would need to almost completely eliminate the, the potential for something like that to happen. The yeah, pot, you yeah. have to eliminate that completely before you get to a point where you're saying, we're going to do this live stream performance and you could, you know, our fans could or maybe are paying something or even if they're not paying if you if you kind of have some uh so, some respectability behind what you're doing or some what do they mm-hmm. say what's the word uh sanctity <laughs> behind what you're mm-hmm. doing you 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 wouldn't want to even have entertain the possibility that there could be some glitch like that that would throw everybody off sync but you're saying that that this is already being done i haven't seen it uh, necessarily in in real time <laughs> It's it's real it's really funny because right now everything you just said got completely glitched out That's like awesome. right towards the end yeah and um, you're currently stuck on my screen. That's that's very meta. <laughs> yeah, even even I'm getting some glitching, and you know, it, if you send like assuming that the audio and everything is recorded nicely, and you're sending sending me your file, this particular exchange about the glitching won't actually the, the actual glitching won't occur in the in the in the podcast but yeah. we'll be talking about it i mean we're literally talking about it right now <laughs> this is what i mean this is like this is, it gets it gets pretty meta after yeah. a while but uh yeah is there like the these uh, performances that you're talking about where they're all jamming with themselves in the studio have they preserved this and put this on youtube somewhere where i can see it yeah it's i, I think you can i think it's on instagram if i'm not mistaken you can check it out uh, live and N sync, I think that's what it is, or maybe it's in. I'll find it. I'll send you a link. Yeah, I think also uh, Parik and Singh also did a performance like that, didn't they? Where they like they kind of like I remember because they put a social media kind of uh. a, a post, basically saying like we've taken our time to figure out like what the best way to do this is, and we we've put effort into fi- figuring out what the best way to to make this translate. Uh, and then I mean I didn't see the the performance. Uh, but uh, I'm just, no. I'm curious as to how... how I didn't know this was happening. Yeah. Well, it, it happened. It happened closer to the beginning of the lockdown. And oh. I'm just curious to see how, what people's experience with this has been. You know, I'm not a performer. I don't plan on performing anytime a- a- soon, but uh, yeah. It, this whole, this like anytime, th- this is like a new medium, right? So anytime there's like a new medium, yeah. there's all these like possibilities that we haven't even thought of yet. And I'm just like waiting to see who does the... Mm-hmm. the the super innovative thing where we're just like, wow, like I can't believe we didn't think of that type thing. I'm, I'm waiting for that revelation yeah, yeah. to occur at some point. I'm sure it will. Yeah. Like I'm sure we're going to get some cool stuff out of this yeah. for sure. At least technology wise. Mm-hmm. All right, man. Well, I guess I'll, I'll let you go. I'm starting to feel the, the sleepiness from the weird, weird sleep, sleeping hours. <laughs> um, I'm also like super hungry now because it's like 3 or 3 p.m. and I normally <laughs> eat at 2 so it's like 17 hours of not eating at this point so, um, oh yeah of course the intermittent fasting <laughs> um, alright man take care and I hope I get to see you in person soon this has been fun man it's been really fun yeah the, the, these podcasts are a lot of fun to do yes and it was good catching up man in general see yeah. you peace out Holmes bye <laughs>